Welcome to the Foster Friendly Podcast, where we come together to make a difference in the lives of children in foster care and the families who care for them. Foster Friendly Communities are part of a nationwide movement by America's Kids Belong that helps people from all walks of life take action and help kids and families thrive. You'll hear from former foster youth, foster and adoptive parents, social workers, faith and business leaders, and other experts on how to engage in meaningful ways. Our hosts, Brian, Travis, and Courtney, explore inspiring stories of everyday people making a difference in foster care where they live and work. Hello, foster friendly audience. I'm Brian Mavis, your humble and incredible host, (laughs) along with uh, two other uh, prideful and mediocre hosts. Wingmates. (laughs) We're wingmen. Wing women, man. <laughs> no, they're incredible. Yeah, I mean, uh, I yeah, I am honored to be uh, hosting with them. We've got Travis and Courtney with us today, and the three of us are doing something a little bit different today. We're not interviewing a guest expert. Instead, we're having a little conversation about a movie that came out uh, a, a month ago. So if you're listening to it, we're doing this recording in... Uh, August of 2024. And the movie is called Sound of Hope, the story of Possum Trot. And this is a movie that is specifically about a church. It's a true story about a church in uh, near Possum Trot, Texas, that a small church, uh, a church that is not wealthy. And uh, 22 families in that church adopted 77 kids that were up for uh, legally free up for adoption in their county. And it's a, an amazing story and it's got uh, people uh, crying about it and thinking about it. And some also um, bringing up some concerns. And so we want to discuss this. And the reason uh, that Travis and Courtney are such exceptional people to have as part of this conversation they are both foster adoptive parents. I'm a, I was a foster parent. Uh, we never adopted, but uh, have uh, um, grandchildren that have been adopted. So we've lived through that as well. And so let's, and again, Travis and Courtney and I, we've, uh, in all honesty, have uh, maybe talked about this movie together for a total of one minute. So uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing what they think about it. So Courtney, let's start with you. Uh, Tell, tell us, you saw the movie, and when you saw the movie, uh, what what were you thinking and feeling? Yeah, so I'll just share. I, um, I'm in part of a support group here where I foster, and we had invited a whole bunch of parents to go with us. Sadly, because of the release date, a lot of people were traveling, and our silly little mm. theater wasn't showing if it was going to be here for an extended period of time, or they only had like a few dates on the calendar. So like, we got to go now. <clears throat> so we invited a whole bunch of people, but it was just my husband and another foster adoptive family that uh, husband and wife that went with us. We went to dinner ahead of time, kind of chatted, and then we went to the movie and it was our first time meeting this other foster dad. Um, mm. We left the movie, all of us, complete silence. I mean, we didn't even know what to say. It was hmm. kind of awkward because, like I said, we had just met this guy and, you know, hmm. both of us wives and my husband had tears just rolling down our face as we walked out of the theater um, hmm. and kind of said our awkward goodbyes because we were all just not even sure what the process at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we got into the car, my husband and I, and we did not speak for many minutes. It was just hmm. quiet. And finally, he just looked at me still crying and said, Wow that just hit home to so many of the kids we've had in our house. Mm. And it brought back so many memories of kids that we had, we saw dramatic healing and then kids that we didn't get to see that. We don't know to this day where, where they're at, mm-hmm. what they're up to, mm-hmm. if they've been healed, if they've not been healed. So it was just really raw and emotional for us that have walked, you know, a lot of that journey that we saw depicted in the film. Yeah. Uh, Travis, what about you? I mean, what, it, what was um, your reaction coming out of that movie? Yeah. I mean, similar to Courtney's, I mean, I just saw what we went to, uh, went to it with, uh, several from our small church and, um, <clears throat> that was cool again, to go with sort of a community that you're with and part of, and we came out in the lobby afterwards and just 
we just kind of like circled up actually kind of in the middle. We were actually in the way as people were going <laughs> around us to get popcorn. We're just kind of <laughs> having an impromptu follow up here. And, but it was just like, we're just processing it together. And I think I, I can really, I feel the same of just, it was like, I feel like I almost needed to just sit for a while um, and, and not even react um, because I think going into it, I mean, I, I knew I was aware of the story. I think I'd read a book on it, but, and, and I knew the inspiration and, and sort of the raw, raw side to, wow. I mean, just what it looks like when a community engages a need and what can happen. But I don't think I realized that the film was going to really, really portray the gritty and real in such a way that, mm. you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's almost wincing at times, which is, which is really good and, and, and fair. Because it's real, real to the story. I think that part was like, wow. Definitely. Yeah. Sobering. What did you guys like about the movie? If you, you know, it's, it's been a, several weeks now since you've seen it. What, what's lived with you as, as far as kind of was highlighted in, you know, a few scenes or a theme or um, what, what was especially poignant? We made our older kids go to the movie after we saw it, Um, Mm. even some that have been adopted, but the the ones that are older now, our one son who's 20 years old, he went to the movie with a group of friends and one of our older boys as well and came back kind of the same as us. And he just Mm. sat there and said, I get it. I get it. And I want to be a foster dad now someday. He's like, I understand why you guys do what you do. And I think that's maybe selfish of me, but I want other people to watch it to see not like see what the Williams go through, but understand these kids that come into our home where they're coming from. Cause so many people just don't get it and they need to understand the trauma and the things they go through. And I thought the movie did a great job of Mm -hmm. depicting again, what these kids have gone through and why they exhibit behaviors that they have. There's a reason behind those behaviors. It's not just Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kids misbehaving. And I thought it did an Mm -hmm. excellent job of that. Yeah, yeah totally. it, it was very good at that. Travis, what what was a highlight or two for you? I think like some scenes kind of stick with me. Um, there was a there was a, a a line, kind of a line by I guess it was one of the older teenager girls, where she said um, she's looking through the car window and she's kind of in a frantic moment of what to do and and all of a sudden she screams into the window with her you know potentially adoptive mom then sitting in the car and she yells, I don't want to be here. And she's like banging the front windshield. And it was like that, that scene for me almost was like her also saying, like, I don't want to be in this life. Like when you're in foster care, you're in the story that you didn't choose and the suffering. And it's not even just, I don't want to be in this home. I mean, there was that, those feelings for her, but it almost was like, I don't want to be in this life. This is what my life is right now. And then on the flip side, I think like, I, I'm I love quotes if you guys know me. So mm-hmm. the, the, there's a historian Thomas Fuller who said some have been thought they were brave because they were afraid to run away. And if you put those two things together, this was a community that mm-hmm. it was their bravery. We're afraid to actually run away. We're gonna be mm-hmm. here and we're gonna be the people for you, even if you don't want to be here. And I, I don't know. It's like those lines together. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the three of us really appreciate what um, was portrayed as being the hard part of foster care. You know, there was another movie that came out a few years ago that, again, I liked it as, as well. It's called Instant Family with Mark Wahlberg as the principal star. Oh, yeah. And it, and there were some kind of hard parts, but not really. I mean, there was quick <laughs> – they, they would relieve you of that tension real quick <laughs> right. uh, with some laugh or something like that. But this didn't. And, um, so one, it kind of, uh, artistically, I liked it. It, it was, you know, it, it could be, um, categorized as a Christian film and which sometimes, uh, those have been, uh, you know, thought of as being cheesy mm-hmm. or that, uh, the message is, is manipulating the story. Right. And I felt like, uh, the Weigels who, uh, wrote, directed, produced this movie, Joshua and Rebecca, who, uh, by the way, who are um, uh, acquaintances or maybe even uh, could be considered friends. They really honored the story Mm. and uh, they let the story lead. And uh, there was still a message. And but that message is a little bit uh, unclear as far as uh, because people come out with uh, some different interpretations of it. 
And so I really love that, that they honored the true story of what happened there, which I think also then has become uh, uh, the um, weakness, or if you want to put it that way. I don't. I didn't see it as a weakness, but it's become the place where people who've seen the movie, they've used that against it. Uh, they've said, okay, uh, that's not what it's like for me, or they didn't cover – you know, what foster care was like, or I don't like how they disciplined a child. And I, I want to say to our listeners right now, you got to remember, this was a movie. It's 90 minutes, you know, approximately. They're not trying to tell the whole story of everybody and everything. They're telling this story. They're honoring that story. And it was set in a particular place, in a particular time, in a particular culture. And so it's not today. It's not where you live. And it may not be your culture. And so um, because of that, uh, it, it's been criticized a little bit because of, because of those things. But with that hmm. said, uh, w with some of those things that ha are shown and said and some of the things that are left out, let's use those as a uh, launch pad to uh, have some conversations about some of the things that were said and like, how's it different today? And some of the things that were left out, like, what about those things that are left out? So um, let me, um, it, Courtney, for you, to you, like, uh, what what would you say was depicted in the in the movie that you would like to say? Well, in um, today's um, times, because that was that movie that was you know about thirty years ago, it's more like this. Um, it would do a little comparison and contrast. Yeah. There's two things that jump out to me immediately. One of them is you, you touched on him. You see a child foster child or foster to adopt child being spanked in the video. And we all know mm -hmm. that you can't do that today. Right. And so I've seen a lot of criticism around that. And again, I'm not understanding the time and the place and realizing mm -hmm. they didn't have the knowledge that we have today about the brain and trauma and mm -hmm. the effects. I mean, it's amazing. We got foster license 17 years ago. And the difference between what we got licensed in and trained in 17 years ago to what people are being trained in today, it's it's a huge difference. And that's mm -hmm. 17 years ago. Right, now I think right. about 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I mean, that it's just different. We were not trained when we first started in what we call TBRI, trust-based relational intervention, which now pretty much any foster or adoptive family knows what that is when you use that acronym. Mm -hmm. You know, So we just need to understand that um, the training was different and our understanding has come a long way. So we should give thanks for that and recognize that it's a positive that we are where we are today rather than taking that little part of the movie and trying to pick it apart. Um, Cause I didn't have that back then. And these foster families, they, again, they were depicting what they knew and what they were trained in. Um, yes, we've gotten better. Uh, the other thing that sticks out to me is, you know, we don't, a lot of the backstory, they can't share everything or it would have been a 10 hour film. Right. A lot of these kids, what people don't understand was they were already waiting children. They were kids waiting to be adopted. So when they come home on the video, you see them coming to a house and they've got welcome home. You know, I think one was Joshua and, you know, I'm your daddy. And they're calling each other mom and dad right away. And I've seen a lot of negative conversation about that because, well, that's not the way you treat kids that are in foster care. It's like, yes, mm -hmm. but again, the time and place, a lot of these kids were waiting kids. It wasn't mm -hmm. like a foster care placement. Right. And the movie didn't go into that detail, but they didn't need to go into that detail either, you know, but I think people just get um, confused by that messaging of I'm your dad, I'm your mom. And in foster care, that's not tr typically how you handle situations like that. Yeah. So that's <laughs> interesting. Those the people who are critics are, are the ones who are more knowledgeable. They've had some experience <laughs> yeah. there. And so, for, so, but what about our listeners who aren't knowledgeable? I mean, they were inspired by the movie, uh, but then their experience might be very different from the movie as far as dealing with child welfare. So uh, Travis to the, to the uh, newbie who is interested in this, who saw the movie or might be seeing a movie now because we're talking about it. What, and they say, I'm signing up, I'm going to do huh. this. What would they experience that would feel different than what they saw? Well, I thought there was going to be all softballs in this episode. Apparently not. So, uh, okay. Thank you for putting me on that one. Uh, 
But <laughs> what, what, Travis, uh, what candy did you get at the, yes. at the movie theater? <laughs> right, exactly. that's, that's probably my intellectual level right there. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, I mean, yeah, like, like Courtney says, like I was doing a little bit of background research of like, it sounds like two, it wasn't until 2001 that, that trauma informed training and the paradigm and therapy of trauma it wasn't even until 2001 that actually sort of even became in the, in the public eye. So when we talk about this film being in 97, I mean, that well predates even that. And then to Courtney's point, stuff even 17 years ago for her has dramatically changed. So I think that what we didn't see in the film is, again, to the context and place of the story, you're the small church in a rural community with, I think, around six to 700 people. Um, not a lot of resources, probably even to their contemporary cities next door or whatever potentially. So fast forward to today where you're going to see so much more along the lines of, you know, trauma training and understanding what's behind behaviors, having a lot more support resources and, you know, whether it's, um, you know, weekly therapy and, and people in the home or going to appointments, you know, we just, what it, what it appeared to be in the film, I think for the viewer was, um, and it was fair to their time was that, man, it's, it's us as this little church and that's it. I mean, we do have the caseworkers that we're kind of talking to, but it's, it's all, it's awesome. And, and, and it's sort of our fervor and passion to hold this thing together. And it's a sinking ship in some cases, you know, yeah, and yeah. whereas I think, I don't know if you guys want to add to that, as far as Courtney, you'd have some good answers to add to what now people would be having. Yeah. And again, they, um, I don't know. I don't know if there were CASAs back in the day, if there were GALs at that time period, but also just recognizing today, when you start fostering, you have a placement come into your house, you've got a team of people wrapping around you and supporting you. It's not like you're just left to the wolves, right? And they weren't because they had each other, which really is another huge highlight of this film. They did such a great job of showing the lows and then it only got better once that community really wrapped around each other. Um, but you don't foster alone. You know, we have mm -hmm. other people that are part of the team and caseworkers that are there more frequently than it uh, viewed or showed in the movie as we saw it. Um, so, yeah, just understanding that there is a team around you. There's a team around the kids. There are a lot of professionals on the team. You're not left alone. Um, and the whole foster to adopt, there are kids in America right now waiting to be adopted that would be placed as a potential foster to adopt. But even then, they're now, most states have the law where they have to be in a foster home for six months before they can be adopted mm -hmm. because we see adoptions fail. We see the placements fail. Um, and so, again, kids usually come in with a mindset of this is a temporary placement, even if the hope is to adopt them. The mindset is temporary to begin with, at least, and then things can transition from there. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. For, so, for our listeners, the in the uh, ecosystem of child welfare and foster care, about three quarters of the kids, they have a goal towards reunification and about a quarter of their goal is um, to be adopted. And so if you're stepping into this space, you might, uh, and again, it depends on city to city, state to state, it, you might hear like, yes, we have a need for adoptive families. And in another place you might say uh, not so much, or it's just the older kids and there's not babies and who knows? It's it's different from place to place. So you you need, need to kind of go in uh, being a uh, a flexible family, like open open to seeing what what is going to happen. Hmm. Um, th there's another part of this film that we haven't touched upon, really. I mean, we've we've it's been mentioned or alluded to is uh, th this is a story about a church. Uh -huh. And how the um, the senior pastor's wife, Bishop Bishop Martin's wife, name I believe is named Donna. Uh, she really feels convicted by God to care for these kids, and uh, convinces her husband, who then convinces the church. And there's a couple of scenes, church scenes. There's a preaching moment, uh, which again, I think even though it was preaching. It wasn't preachy. It, gosh, I thought it was so powerful <laughs> um, about the call of the church to step into these hard places. 
Uh-huh. And um, so, t- I mean, t- tell me just again, this is something you guys, we have not discussed. Uh, what, what was your coming out of that? What was, what was stirring your heart about the church, the story of a church stepping up and what you would hope for the church or what your experience has been with the church? I saw some, again, read some negative things about, well, it's just not realistic. And it's like, well, this is a real story. This really did happen. You know? <laughs> right. It's not realistic. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> like a church okay. committee can't really do that. And it's like, well, they can. And that's the, they you did. know, we can't all, they and did, maybe we're yeah. not going to be possum trots, right? Oh, not all of our cities can be a possum trot story <laughs> in ending. But uh, the number is something like if at one in every church, adopted one kid or took in one kid out of foster care, there wouldn't be kids waiting in the foster care system today. You know, and and again, I just think the church needs to wake up. I don't think they recognize and realize this this mission mission field. And not even this the mission field, but the numbers that this is right here in our backyard. You know, we talk, I tell people all the time, we started this journey of adoption. We started a little bit in foster care, but then it kind of quickly led to adoption. Everything we researched, we started typing in adoption in Google or whatever, talking to people. It was all about international adoption. Mm-hmm. It was like this mm-hmm. foster care thing wasn't really talked about. We brought it to our church and said, hey, we we need to have a ministry around this. And mm-hmm. at first our pastor was like, well, well, why? You know, And we educated them and they said yes. But again, I just think the education behind it to the churches um, is just something that needs to be brought forth. And churches need to wake up their wake up, open their eyes to this need in our communities. Yeah, that's really good. I, it is interesting because I want to hear Brian, your perspective. I've heard you have a bit of a nuanced take. Um, so I'm setting you up for potentially not a softball. <laughs> <here today. laughs> it's payback, but uh, yes. So I feel like what's intention here is exactly what Courtney said, where I've also read where people kind of take, it's an easy projection to watch this film and go, okay, there's, there's potentially, I think something around 400,000, you said, Churches in the U.S., 400,000 kids fluctuating in care at any time throughout the year. That's a one-to-one ratio. If every church just brought in one, and that seemed, and, and I think that's a, that is a definitely a takeaway, an inspirational takeaway. However, I think, Brian, I've heard you talk about in a nuanced way. There's a little bit of a pushback to that as well. I mean, you know what I'm, so do you want to, what would your comment be around yeah, it, it, it's not it's not nuanced. It's uh, okay. it's confrontational. There we go. Even but be- even better. <laughs> and, 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 and it's and if it's contrarian for sure. Contrarian. So uh, there is again. So the math works, and uh, and the and I I'm a critic of it because I said, hey, it works on paper. It's never going to work in real life. And uh, the and the other point is even more importantly, you don't want it to work that way, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I would much rather see what happened at Possum Trot at that, that church than to have one church pick one kid, hmm. and uh, and I'd rather see few ch- fewer churches, like five percent. Let's use that as a, a a guess number. Five five out of every one hundred say we're going to get really good at this, and we're going to have many uh, or several. Uh, kids and families, and it's going to be part of our culture and they're not going to feel alone and they're uh, not going to look like outsiders. And so how this really happened for me, because I used to be the, Hey, if every one church did one kid would be done is I was um, speaking uh, publicly at a, a, at a gathering about this in Florida. And afterwards I had uh Travis, you were there at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a, a young family uh, come up in their mid thirties. Uh, they uh, had been foster adoptive parents for a decade, and they came up and simply said, uh, "Can we uh, a- a- get some advice from you?" And I said, "Okay, uh, what what do you need?" And they explained that uh, their situation and that they had been in a church. They had grown up at this church. It was a church that about 800 people attended on a, uh, Wednesday, on, a, on a weekend. And they said, we've been, you know, foster adoptive parents for the past 10 years. Uh, we've asked to, for support, to feel seen, to be, you know, helped have others uh, do some sort of ministry. And they said, 
you know, we have gotten nowhere. And then they, here's, here's what really got me this line. They said, um, we feel so alone and our kids feel like they don't belong. And it, because of, uh, uh-huh. you know, there's being the only, only family, only kids. And the kids may have been, it might've been a, um, multi-ethnic family. And then they asked, this was what the advice they asked. They said, um, what should we do? And I was surprised by what came out of my mouth because I'm a very loyal guy. And mm-hmm. I said, uh, quit rewarding bad behavior and find a church where you don't feel alone and your kids feel like they belong. And the, mm. that convicted me, just my own, my own words was like, oh, this is the better way uh, where um, you aren't the f- family that everybody's looking at and wondering about and how come the kids are behaving this way but you're understood. You're not alone. The kids feel like they're a part of a community. They belong. And so I'm a big believer in what happened at Possum Trot. I think that's the better way to do it. It's not the only way, Uh but I love to see churches who say, Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do it. Well, when it gets hard, we're going to get better. And I think it's the kind of thing where the church will probably going to go in with this, um, we're going to save the kids mentality and a decade later, the wise ones in the church are going to say, these kids help save the church. They hmm. help us become the kind of church God wants the church to be. I love that you say that because I can tell you truthfully right now, I can think of easily 20 plus people that have told me they left the church once they started fostering or adopted. Because mm-hmm. the church did not support them and they've not gone back. And they mm. all, I hear it all the time. And I, even again, reading through, I have a friend that kind of posted some, she watched the film, loved the film, but just had some hard emotions afterwards and kind of commented on Facebook. And I was reading through all these comments. And so many of the people that commented were foster adoptive parents saying, me too, me too, about the community aspect of when things get tough, the community disappears. You know, they're all mm-hmm. about it until mm. things get tough or until behaviors get tough or until you say, hey, we're drowning. Saying mm-hmm. you're drowning and they walk away or don't know how to help you. Mm-hmm. So definitely, I feel like that is just something we really need to pour into as churches <clears throat> that are doing this well and, and equip them and encourage them, train them. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely something that we need to focus on. Amen. Yeah, that's, uh, gosh, uh, Courtney, the the negative side of what I shared, uh, the people have left. That's mm-hmm. that's really convicting. and. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, that kind of thing. I mean, I, I yeah, I have some family stuff going on that it, it's there's a s- similar experiences happening. So mm-hmm. it's it's real. Um, and yeah. I do think um, I, I am a true believer that um, the church will be transformed in, in a, a more uh, Christ-like, cruciform. If we want to kind of start using these theological words way. And I think that's the, that is the Jesus way. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to respond to that too, to just say, I'd read a really critical book on um, taking largely pro- mainline evangelical churches to task on the way they've engaged foster care. And, you know, some things were unfair in this book. I can't remember the title, but oh, one yeah. of the, yeah, remember that? So one yes. of, one of the things that he highlighted though, and it was kind of a big longitudinal wide study interviewed a lot of ministries and everything, but it was like kind of the notion was everything looks good as a mission and on a slideshow and going overseas and all these things where it involves us leaving, like maybe going to serve in a safe way to come back. Like, like you drop into an easy thing and you come back and we get all the pictures and it looks really cool. And then everyone gives, you know, that kind of thing. What happens when you actually engage foster care in a way that's, that's really like deep work is it, it means that you're bringing that inside your walls. And that could mean then in, in your childcare, you now have large donating members that are going, wait, but there's going to be kids that from hard places that are with my kid in care in our, mm-hmm. you know, in Sunday school or whatever. And it's like, I don't know what that is going to happen to them or are we safe now? Do we? And so that fear is what really, it's like, once this comes within our walls, Okay, that's too much now. Like, can we just keep right. this a ministry that's, you know? And I think that's the story of Possum Trot. 
Yeah. <laughs> the it's... Doors open wide. Yeah. And so again, I love the church and I can be a critic of it because I love it. Uh, uh, it's, uh, many of the churches are, when they have that kind of ministry, it's transactional. They can, they can cross the tracks and then they can come back home. And we're saying it's time to have the tracks run right through the church, right through the home. And, um, so let, um, so I do want to say well done possum trot church. Uh, mm -hmm. Great job. And Weigels, thank you for capturing that story. And I hope more churches uh, will be inspired to step up, that they won't say that's not realistic, you know, especially since you pointed out it's a true story. Uh, but they can think, okay, we may not be the next possum trot, and we don't have to be, but we, we can be faithful to what we can be next. And there's churches who can really help. I'll, I'll say, um, I think a lesson, though, that I, I would want to emphasize to churches, if you are stepping up, is first before you start, like, hey, let's step into the, you know, you know, jump into the deep end and start recruiting families and getting kids in. First, stop, uh, investigate before you activate, ask some questions. The first set of questions you probably need to ask are inside your church: who in our church is already involved, and how are they doing? And come wrap around them, see and support them before you um, start uh, recruiting more uh, families in, into this. Uh, so families will say yes when they see that um, they're being supported. Yeah, and even to add to that, our church is a brand new church. We launched on Easter Sunday. So we're a new church. Mm -hmm. And Currently, we are the only foster family within the church, but our children's ministry director said we are going to be trauma informed and get trauma sensitivity training from day one. So our very first child training, child ministry training included trauma sensitivity, trauma sensitivity training. And the heartbeat behind that is, yes, the Williams might be the only ones right now, but we don't want to wait until we have five fostering families in our church and then backtrack and have to get it then. We want to be prepared and ready. And that's another great way that churches can do that right now. Get your child ministry workers, your youth ministry workers trained mm -hmm. in understanding these things and how they can best support them before they come into your church, not as a reactive type thing. And Good these thought. kind of uh, things that you'll learn there, uh, they apply way beyond kids who are in foster care. There's, you know, yeah. uh, there's other kinds of trauma that happen to uh, children, youth and adults that ha has nothing to do with foster care. And so and even those it's it's basically, a, you know, you're going to learn stuff on how to be a um really good at relationships when relationships get hard. And so it, I would encourage that. So Courtney, let's, let's end, end there. And now let's, uh, Travis, you want to also, I'll give you a chance if you want to have a final word, but uh, Courtney, I do want to say um, where, where, if a church was interested, a youth group, a children's ministry, a church in general, and they said, okay, uh, we want to learn more about trauma. Um, where, where would you point them to, to um, get started? I'd say America's Kids Belong because we have resources, um, <laughs> a trauma training that's available online for churches that want to have that. Our affiliate states also, many of them offer things like that. And there are a lot of other resources. We have them linked on our website at our resources tab. Um, other TBRI or trauma trainings for churches. Um, there's tons of free resources out there, but there are ones that are specifically geared for churches, for ministries like that. And we have our very yeah. own. So, Great. Yeah. Awesome. Travis, yeah. any no, advice? The only thing any... I'm going to add is it did make me think, what was my favorite snack the night of the movie you asked? I think it, was the Mike, <laughs> it was the Mike and Ike. I, it what? just hit me. So that's, Mike and Ike. Oh, yeah. Uh, I yeah. Mean, that's, yeah. So. that's like, yeah, it's like, I think Seinfeld is that that might be one of their <laughs> f favorite. Uh, yeah. There's a whole episode about the uh, movie candy. So uh, I'm glad you took it there, Travis. Uh, it's important. It's real. that. We get, yeah, we get good snacks uh, at our, at the movies. And so grateful for you too. Thank you for sharing your thoughts today about this important film and using this film as a real launch pad to have some very important and meaningful conversations. Yeah. Yeah. There's a great closing line. I would say from the film, it's one of the actors, it was Donna. We are people now and love never gives up. That's the film. Awesome. Yeah. Good way to end. 
Thanks. All right. All right. Bye, everybody. See, See ya. you in the next podcast. See ya. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, will you help us reach more people by subscribing, sharing the podcast with a friend, and leaving a five-star review? If you've been inspired by what you've heard today and want to learn more of how you can make a difference for kids in foster care and the foster families where you live, visit americaskidsbelong.org. We depend on individual donors to fund our work. We'd be grateful if you would consider joining us as a monthly donor. Visit americaskidsbelong.org to make your tax-deductible donation. Thank you. Together, we can ensure a family for every child in foster care and a foster-friendly community to ensure every foster family feels loved and supported.